Good morning, Mountain Lake Church. How's everyone feeling this morning? Y'all feel good? Anyone excited to be at church this morning? Come on, I love it, I love it, I love it. Uh, like Nathan said, I'm so excited to be here. My name is Gerald Fadiomi. It's such an honor and a privilege uh, to get to spend this Sunday morning with you. We're in week two of this series, My Life, My Response, and I'm excited for where y'all are headed this summer, that you'll be in this series this whole summer, um, but I'm also really excited for where we're headed this morning, so I'd love to pray and we can jump in. Father, we love you and we thank you. Um, I can say words, but I can't move hearts. Only you can do that. And so, God, I just ask that your spirit would be present, uh, that you would speak not only um, to those of us in seats, but, Father, would you speak to me as well? Would we walk out of here changed because you moved? We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Since this is my first time, I feel like there's a few things that you need to know about me. The first is this, is that both of my parents are African. Now, when I say African, I'm not talking about African-American. I'm talking about African-African. My dad is from Nigeria. His name is Oluwafemi. My mom is from Liberia. Her name is Equa. Somehow the two came together and had a kid by the name of Gerald. (laughs) Right. It's like the whitest name for the blackest person ever. I have no idea how that happened, but it did, and I'm here. Second thing you need to know uh, about me is I've been married for about two years now to the most incredible woman in the world. Actually, it's been two years as of last month, Uh, so I have marriage figured out. Yeah, I know, I know, right? Thank you. Um, Yeah, so I completely have marriage figured out after two years. Really, really got it down pat. Uh, Third thing you need to know about me is I'm a huge Florida Gator fan. Any other Gators in the room this morning? Okay, all right. I think we got about two other Christians in the room this morning. Uh, If you just booed me at church, that says more about you than it does about me. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Uh, And the last and final thing you need to know about me is I love a good picture. Anyone else in the room just love a good picture? Good picture with your family, good picture with your friends, of nature. I love a good picture, and I will do just about anything for a good picture. In fact, uh, December, my wife and I decided that we were going to go on a road trip together. Uh, And we decided to drive from Atlanta to Denver because Denver was on both of our bucket lists. It's about a 19 and a half hour drive if you drive directly there one way. Uh, Well, it was around Christmas time, and so we couldn't go straight to Denver. We actually needed to go up to Chicago to spend Christmas with her family. And so we decided to make a massive trip out of this, that we would drive from Atlanta to Nashville, from Nashville to Chicago, from Chicago to Wisconsin, from Wisconsin to Iowa, from Iowa to Mount Rushmore so that I could get a picture in front of Mount Rushmore because I had to have the picture, and then from Mount Rushmore to Denver. We'd spend four days in Denver, drive back across Kansas, and get back to Atlanta, 60 hours in the car together, and yes, I am still married. <laughs> I know. Uh, it actually ended up being one of, one of our favorite trips of all time. We packed up everything that we owned uh, in our house. I packed about 16 pair of shoes. Don't judge me. I had to have options. And so I fill up the car, uh, and we jump into the vehicle and get ready to head. It's about at this time that I should let you know that we drive a 2014 Hyundai Elantra. Which doesn't mean a lot to, which doesn't mean much to a lot of us in the room, but for some of us, you understand. My wife and I have just committed to a 60 hour road trip through the north in a front wheel drive four door sedan. <laughs> this is not a good idea. But we did it. So we get in the car, we proceed to drive from Atlanta to Nashville. We get there in great time. We spend the night at my mentor's house, hang out with him and his family. We wake up in the morning, we have breakfast together. It's an incredible time. Uh, We get back in the car, we drive from Nashville to Chicago, and on the way to Chicago, we run into this substance that I had never seen, heard of, or experienced before. Uh, It was called freezing fog. Anyone know what that is? I still don't know what it is, okay? Uh, It was foggy, I couldn't see. It was cold, but nothing was freezing. So I'm like, what in the world is going on? But we get through the freezing fog, we make it up to Chicago, we spend Christmas there a couple days after, it's great. We pack back up in the car and proceed to drive to Wisconsin to see my wife's dad's side of the family. Uh, We get there for about two hours uh, because that's really all the time that you need in Wisconsin. It's a miserable state. (laughs) Um, If you're from Wisconsin, I am so sorry. Not that I made fun of it, but that you're from Wisconsin. It's really miserable. Um, And so we leave Wisconsin, and we proceed to drive to Iowa. Now, on the way to Iowa, I run into another substance that I've only experienced at Dairy Queen. It's called a blizzard. Um, You know, and, uh, you know, I'm used to eating them, not driving in them. And so this was a different experience for me, but this was only about 10-mile-an-hour winds, and so it wasn't too bad, and I was able to navigate it and get my wife and I safely to Iowa. Now, why my wife thought it was a good idea 
um, to allow me to pick the Airbnb that we were going to stay in in Iowa. I have no idea, but she thought it was a good idea. And so me being the good husband that I am, I decided that I was going to make this Airbnb an experience, okay? I got us a vintage 1800s Airbnb in the middle of Iowa. I think what I did not read in the description was that it had not been touched since the 1800s. <laughs> and so we walk into this house about 11 o'clock at night, and immediately we smell the smell of a dead animal. It feels like it's coming from the living room. And so we start walking around and looking, and about five minutes in, my wife looks at me and she goes, Gerald, we are not staying here. And I said, girl, we paid for this. We are staying here, okay? And so put your stuff in the bedroom. We are staying in this Airbnb. So we walk in the bedroom. We put our stuff on the bed. And it's at this moment that I realize that my wife is right and that I was wrong. Because as I proceed to look around the bedroom, I kid you not, there are portraits of people who look like they died in the 1700s, and they are all surrounding the bed. <laughs> as if they are waiting for us to fall asleep. And so I pull my wallet out, I grab my man card, I throw it out the window, and I said, girl, we are going to a hotel. We are not staying here. And she's like, you're right, we're not staying here. Lesson number one, always listen to your wife. So we get in the car, we drive to the hotel, we spend the night there, we wake up in the morning, we're eating breakfast together, and the news report comes on, and we're watching it, and it says, winter storm Ebony is on the way. Now, I don't know if it's just because I'm from the hood, but for some reason, when I heard this, I heard it as like, winter storm Ebony is on the way, right? And so I'm watching this news report, and I turn to my wife, and I go, baby, we got two options. I said, we can either stay here in Narnia, <laughs> or we can beat this storm. And I looked at her, and she looked at me. I said, girl, pack your bags. We are going. Ebene ain't got nothing on me. Let's go. So we get in the car. We pack everything up. I am driving at a speed that I will not tell you because I am a pastor. I got Hillsong on full blast. I know the Lord is with me. We are driving through. There's no snow. There's no wind. It is a beautiful day. And then we get to the border of South Dakota, and Ebene came and said, hey, at full speed. 30 mile an hour winds moving around the car like this. And on the inside, I'm like, we're going to die. We're going to die. We're going to die. The news report is going to read, black pastor dies in South Dakota. <laughs> but on the outside, I'm like, girl, don't worry. I got you. Thug life. I didn't choose it. It chose me. We're good. Right? And so that lasted for about five minutes before I said we have to pull over. And uh, we stayed in Mitchell, South Dakota for the night. If you're wondering what Mitchell, South Dakota is known for, it's known for its corn palace. If you're wondering what that is... It's a palace made of corn. <laughs> That's it. So we spend the night in Mitchell, South Dakota. We wake up in the morning and proceed to drive uh, to Mount Rushmore because I had to have my picture 45 miles an hour on a highway with a speed limit of 80 miles an hour because the roads were so icy. But we did all of that so that I could get this picture right here. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm not, we're not like a Christmas card family, um, but we're doing Christmas cards this year, okay? Uh, and it's going to be that picture. So if you want one, just DM me on Instagram or hit me up on Facebook, and we're going to send them to any and everyone who wants one because that is a good picture, my friends. Uh, so we leave Mount Rushmore, we get to Denver, we have a great time, and we have this incredible, incredible trip. I was thinking about that road trip, uh, and I thought about this series that we're in, My Life, My Response. And I was just reminded of the simple truth that we all have a picture in our mind that we will do literally anything to get to. I had this picture of Mount Rushmore that I would drive through storms and blizzards and freezing fog and dark roads and country cities and places that I never thought that I would be so that I could get to the picture that I had in my mind. And we all have that picture. We have a picture for our future. We have a picture for who we want to be, for where we want to go, for what we want to accomplish, for what we want our life to look like. And that's why I love this series so much, because on the road to the picture in our mind, there are storms and trials and tribulations and things that come in our way and can stand in the way and can keep us from getting where we ultimately want to go. That's what Chris talked about last week. So what do you do when trouble comes your way? What do you do when you're driving towards a picture and a storm intercepts your trip and it interrupts where you're headed and it interrupts where you're going? What do you do when bad things happen, what do you do when trouble comes your way? If you didn't watch that message, you need to go back and watch it. It was absolutely incredible. But this morning, I want to pose a, a different question. Because on the journey of life, it's not just trials and tribulations and 
hard things and difficult circumstances that stay in the way. It's not just trouble that interrupts our plan. Sometimes it's actually Jesus that does. Sometimes it's actually Jesus that steps right into the middle of the plan that you had for your life and for your future and for your kids. And so the question this morning is this, is what do you do when Jesus interrupts your plans? What do you do when Jesus interrupts your plans? I'll give you some examples. You have a picture for your relationships? Maybe a relationship with a parent, maybe a relationship with a family member. And maybe the picture that you had in mind was that there's some tension in that relationship. There's been some drama. Maybe there was a fight. Maybe at 18 you decided, I'm never talking to them again. I'm going to do it my own way. And there's been distance in the relationship. And your picture is that it would stay that way. But what do you do when Jesus steps in and he goes, hey, I need you to forgive them? What do you do in those moments? You have a picture for your career. Maybe it's that you would climb the ladder and eventually you'd get to the seat and you'd become the boss and everyone would be looking to you because you got the promotion and you put in the hard work. But along the way, they're starting to ask you to do some things that morally you're not sure that you should necessarily do because Jesus is calling you to a different standard. What do you do when he steps into the picture that you have for your work life? You have a picture for your kids and for their future for the people that they'll be, for the type of person that they'll marry, maybe for what their career will be. But what do you do when your kid comes to you and says, hey, I feel like God is moving me in a different direction, and they pick a career that you don't necessarily agree with or that isn't going to make them a lot of money, and it feels like your investment is going out of the window. What do you do when Jesus interrupts that plan? You have a picture for your friendships, for the people that you'll hang out with, for the people who will be in your small group. Well, what do you do when there's this person that keeps showing up over and over and over again in your picture and they drive you absolutely crazy? And you walk out of the bathroom and you're like, I hope she's not there. And you turn and she is right in your face. <laughs> you're like, I cannot get away from her. What do you do when Jesus is calling you to be friends with someone you don't want to be friends with? When he interrupts your picture. You have a picture for your faith. And maybe for some of you, if you were to be completely honest, the picture that you have for your relationship with God is that you would show up at church on Sunday and you would check the box and then you would go live your life the way you want Monday through Saturday. But what do you do when Jesus steps into the middle of that picture and he goes, no, 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 it's a relationship. I want to know you every day of the week. What do you do in those moments? What do we do when Jesus interrupts our plans? To answer that question, I want to take a look at a passage of scripture. It's one of my favorite Um, section of scriptures in the Bible. It's Luke chapter 5. It's the moment that Peter first decides to follow Jesus. And what I love so much about this particular book is that Luke um, wasn't a, a disciple. He didn't walk with Jesus. He didn't talk with Jesus. He was a physician who, after the fact, came back around and said, I need to know who he is. I've heard the rumors, so I have to write an orderly account and figure out this whole story of this Jesus. And so he interviewed eyewitnesses, and he Uh, examined all of the evidence, and he put together this orderly account of the life of Jesus. This is not just a story in the Bible. These aren't just words on the pages. This is evidence of who Jesus actually was and the life that he actually lived. And in Luke chapter 5, we see the moment that Peter decided to follow Jesus. I'll read it to you, and then we'll pull a few things out of it. It says this. It says, one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, that, uh, the one belonging to Simon or Peter, and asked him to put out a little bit from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Peter, put out into the deep waters and let your nets down for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, Jesus, I'll let down my nets. When they had done so, such a large number of fish, uh, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. When Jesus, then Jesus said to Simon, Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up to the shore, left everything, and they followed him. There's three things that I think Peter began to understand in this interaction with Jesus that if we would begin to understand, I think would help us appropriately respond when Jesus interrupts our plans. So I want to take you back through the story and point out these three things. Jesus is teaching, and this crowd of people is there to hear him teach. 
Everywhere that Jesus went, there would be a crowd because his popularity had grown. They wanted to see what miracles he was going to do, what lesson he was going to teach. And so this crowd of people is there to hear Jesus. The problem, though, was that Jesus didn't have a microphone in his day, and so he had to find a way to amplify his voice so that the crowd would be able to hear what it is that he had to say. And so he looks around and he sees, okay, there's these, these boats. So he steps into the boat that happened to belong to Peter. And he knows that from the boat he can amplify his voice off of the water so the crowd can hear. So he says, hey, Peter, would you mind pushing off a little bit from the shore? And Peter obliges and rows out just a little bit. Jesus sits down and he begins to preach this message to the crowd. But once he's done, he turns his attention to Peter. This is the first thing that that I want us to see in this interaction between Peter and Jesus is that while there is a crowd of people that Jesus speaks to, he never misses out on a conversation with an individual. That while there is a crowd of people, of millions and millions and millions, billions of people who follow Jesus, Jesus never misses out on an opportunity to speak to an individual. And I would just imagine in a room this size that there are people who walked in here this morning feeling like you're just another face in the crowd, feeling like you're just another mom, who's doing all that she can to keep the family together and nobody notices. Feeling like you're just another employee at a job doing your nine to five and nobody sees you or cares. Feeling like you're just another person sitting in a seat at a church and and nobody actually knows you or cares about you. I would imagine that there's people who are sitting in this room this morning wondering, would anyone notice if I left this world? Is it even worth me being here? Worse than that, I'd I'd imagine that there's people in the room this morning who are thinking, does God see me? Does God know me? Does God care about me? Does he know the plans that I have for my life? Does he know the troubles that I'm facing? Does he know what's going on? And I just had to pause here for a second to remind you that God sees you individually. That you are not just another face in the crowd. That you are not in this room by mistake. That you're not just a mom holding the family together, and you're not just an employee at a job, and you're not just a person sitting in the seat, that God sees you, that God knows you, that God loves you, and it does matter to him whether or not you exist. The fact that there is breath in your lungs means that there's purpose for your life, and you are not here by mistake. You are not a face in the crowd, and I believe that Jesus is stepping into your boat this morning, and he's going, okay, yeah, I have something that I want to say to everyone, but there's something that I want to say specifically to you, because I know what you're going through, and I know your situation, and I know who you are. And Jesus sees Peter individually and begins this conversation with this fisherman. He says, hey, Peter, would you you row out a little bit deeper? And I imagine as Peter begins to start rowing, Adele rolling in the deep is playing in the background. (laughs) And they get out into the deep waters, and, and Jesus says, hey, Peter, would you let your nets down for a catch? Peter responds, Jesus, I've been fishing all night. I haven't caught anything. Now, here's the thing. I don't know a ton about fishing. I can't say that that's what I do on a weekend. I could probably think about a thousand million other things that I'd rather do uh, on the weekend, the fishing. And so I had to Google why Peter would even respond the way that he did. And here's what I learned in the process um, is that in fishing, and I could be wrong about this, but if, if I am, blame Google, not me. Um, that in fishing, you don't want to fish in the middle of the day because the waters are hotter. That's what f- amateurs fish, amateur fishermen do. You go out, you fish in the middle of the day, you hope you catch something. But an expert fisherman fishes either at night or early in the morning because the waters are cooler and fish begin to rise, and so it's easier to catch. So when Peter hears Jesus say, let your nets down for a catch, he's going, Jesus, that doesn't make any sense. I know, like, rabbi guy, I get it. Um, I am a fisherman. This is what I do, Jesus. Like, this is not the time of the day that you're supposed to fish. But you know what? You know what, Jesus? If you say so, I'll let my nets down for a catch. You're going to be in for a rude awakening, buddy. Drops his nets. And according to Scripture, Peter catches so many fish that his, boats begins to, his boat begins to sink. Uh, according to Scripture, Peter literally catches a boatload of fish. And not one, but two. So he has to call to the other guys. Yo, 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 guys, guys, you're not going to believe this. I know, middle of the day. I just caught so many fish, they don't fit in the boat. Get your boat over here and let's fill these things up. This is crazy. And so as they're filling up the boats, I imagine that Peter has a moment where he pauses and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. Two boatloads? This is not supposed to happen. What? Who are you? You're not just some rabbi. You're not just some 
some teacher. No, 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 you are something so much bigger. This is the second thing that I want us to see in this text because it's in this moment that Peter realizes that Jesus is bigger than he thought he was. That God is far bigger than we think. That he is able to do more than we could ever ask or imagine. That he's able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. And it's in this moment that Peter is looking at Jesus and he's going, oh my you. (laughs) This is amazing. This is crazy. Nature obeys you. This does not make any sense at all. You are far bigger than I ever thought you could be. Listen, I need you to hear me say this this morning. It is our job as pastors to stand on this stage and help you see and understand God in, in, a, in, a, a, more, in a better way. It's our job to help you understand who God is and what he is like. But I need you to hear me say this. It doesn't matter how many sermons we preach. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how well you know your Bible, how much you pray, or how good of a Christian you think you are. God is still bigger than you think he is. He does not fit into your box. He does not align with your rules. He does not vote the way that you vote. He does not think the way that you think. His thoughts are not your thoughts and his ways are not your ways. He is bigger than you can imagine, which is good news because he's bigger than the situation you're facing. He's bigger than the troubles that have come your way. He's bigger than what you are going through. And he is bigger than the plans that you might have planned for your own life. And Peter realizes this in this moment, that God sees him individually, that he is bigger than he thought he was. And his response is fear. I can't be around you. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. He starts acknowledging his own brokenness, and he goes, God, you are too big, and I am too small. You are too infinite, and I am too finite. I am, I am just a human, and you are God and a bod. I cannot be around you, and I love the way that Jesus responds. He looks at Peter, and he goes, no, 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 Peter, Peter, Peter. Don't be afraid. Come on, dude, I knew who you were before I got in the boat. I know what you've done. I know your story. I know what keeps you up at night. I know what you're wrestling with. I knew who you were before I got in the boat with you. Peter, you don't have to be afraid. And that's when Jesus says the statement to Peter that absolutely wrecks the rest of his life in the best way possible. He goes, Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be a fisher of men. So what you have to understand is that Peter had a plan for his life. Peter had a picture for what his life would be. He was a fisherman. That was his plan for his career. Most scholars believe that the reason he was a fisherman is because his dad was a fisherman before him. And so he was fulfilling the family business. Peter was married at this point, so he had a plan for his relationships. He knew what that was going to look like. And his thought was that he would live in his small town, that he would keep the family business going, he would catch fish, and he would provide for his wife. He'd catch some and feed the family, sell some, and this would be the rest of his life. But then Jesus steps on the scene with a Messiah lean, and he goes, no, 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 Peter, I have more for you than that. I have more in store, Peter, than what you have in mind. I have bigger plans for you, bigger dreams for you, bigger hopes for you. Peter, I know you're a fisherman, and you're great at it, but you are going to be a fisher of men. I have influence for you and opportunity for you that you could never even imagine. You see, God had more in store than what Peter had in mind, and the same is true for us. That's the third thing, that God has more in store than what you have in mind. That regardless of what your picture is, how good or bad it is, that God has more in store for you than anything you could have imagined for yourself. And I imagine what's happening for Peter in this moment as he comes to these three realizations that God sees him individually, uh, that God is bigger than he thought, and that God had more in store than what he had in mind. Imagine what was happening in his heart is that he was holding his plans like this. I'll be a fisherman. I'll live in my city. I'll feed my wife. Everything is going to be great, and I'll just stay right here. Everything will be okay. But then Jesus shows up, and he goes, oh, he sees me. Oh, oh, oh he's, he's bigger than, than I am. Oh, he has plans for me. And Peter began to open his hands. He began to trust God with his plans. And so according to Luke's account, he gets out of the boat. He leaves everything behind. And he proceeds to follow Jesus. I love this. It reminds me of what the psalmist said in, in Psalm 9 10. He says this. He says, and those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. What is the psalmist saying? He's saying, hey, those who know you live lives that look like this because they trust you. 
And they know that whatever they could have planned for themselves could be good, but what you have for them is far bigger, it's far better than anything that they could ever imagine on their own. So those who know you, those who really know you, know that you're not going to leave them or forsake them. And so they walk through life with their hands wide open to the plans that you might have for them, and they walk wherever you would have them to go. Now, I want to be really clear about what was on the table for Peter and what was on the table and what's on the table for us this morning. More is not a mistake-free life. Peter made a lot of mistakes. In fact, Peter made arguably the biggest mistake in the New Testament. Jesus, I'll never leave you. I'll never turn my back on you. I'll literally die for you. And then he betrays him three times in a row. Massive mistake. More is not a problem-free life. Peter had some problems that came his way. In fact, he was crucified upside down, excruciating death. It's not problem-free. More is not a wealth-guaranteed life. Hey, if you follow Jesus, everything's going to go great. You'll get whatever you want, and you'll just be as rich as you could ever imagine. This is not a prosperity gospel. That's not what following Jesus is. That's not more. No, no, more is a purpose in life. It's waking up every morning knowing that you're a part of something that's bigger than you. More is more meaning in life. It's the small things becoming big things because Jesus is in the picture. More is... A richness to life that money can't buy. That was on the table for Peter. And when Peter realized that, he'd started to let go of his plans and open his hands and trust God and move in the direction of Jesus. And when he did, he experienced more. It's crazy to me. 2,000 years later, we're in a church in Forsyth County and we're talking about a fisherman. 2,000 years later, we're sitting in this room and there are people in this room who are named after a fisherman from 2,000 years ago. It doesn't make any sense. But it's what happened when Peter lived his life like this. You know what's crazy to me? It's not just Peter's story. It's that this really is just the story of what happens when Jesus interrupts your plan and you respond in the right way. You know the story of Zacchaeus? Anyone remember that story? You know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. What a terrible theme song for someone's life. Imagine him being the starting point guard on his basketball team. Ladies and gentlemen, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. The other team would be like, bro, what? Like you? Are you kidding me? Zacchaeus' story, he had a picture and a plan for his day. He was a tax collector. Everyone would have hated him because he took money from his own people, gave it to Rome, and then he took extra on top so that he could get rich. His plan for his day is I'm going to climb up in the tree, and hopefully I'll get to see this Jesus guy that everyone's talking about. So he climbs in the tree. He sees Jesus. He goes, picture perfect, day complete, everything's great, except for Jesus sees him and says, Zacchaeus, get out of the tree. I see you, and I'm bigger than you think I am. I'm coming over to your house. And by the end of the meal, Zacchaeus walked out of his house like this, going, everything that I've stolen from people, I'm giving back multiplied. Because God had more in store for Zacchaeus' day than he had in mind. You remember the story of the woman at the well? This woman who had had five different husbands and who was hiding out from society because she would be ridiculed by the people in her own hometown. And so her plan was to get water in the hottest part of the day so that nobody would see her. So she goes with her bucket to a well in the hottest part of the day when no one is around. And she gets to the well, and here is this Jewish man who is sitting there. And here she is as a Samaritan woman, and they begin a conversation. Side note, God is bigger than you think he is. Because they're not supposed to be talking. But Jesus doesn't fit in the box. He doesn't follow the rules. He doesn't do the social norm. He speaks to this woman, tells her about her entire life, which would normally be embarrassing. But for some reason, at the end of the conversation, the woman leaves the well. I don't even know if she has the bucket. I imagine she just turns like this. And she's like, I'm going back. And I'm telling everyone about this Jesus. She didn't even want to be seen. And she goes back into her hometown telling everyone about who Jesus is. And they go and meet Jesus, and it says that they believe that he is the Messiah because of her testimony. See, God had more in store than what she had in mind for her day. But y'all, I want to be clear. These aren't just stories in the Bible. God is still doing this today. How do I know? Because it's my story. You see, I had a picture and a plan for my life. My um, mom went to jail my junior year in high school. My dad left when I was in the third grade. So at 16, I was on my own. And I decided that I was going to be a club promoter. I would throw parties all over the city of Atlanta. I would drink every day. I'd smoke weed every day. I'd hook up with as many girls as possible. I would live the life of the rich and famous. And everything was going to be great for me. And so I went down that scene. I got really, really good at it. I did it for three years. And at the end of my time throwing parties in the city, I lost some really good friends of mine. 
three murdered, one commit suicide, all in the same year. I found myself sitting in a church, and Jesus interrupted my plan. I said, hey, I want you to stop throwing parties. I said, ugh. All right, if you say so. So I left the club scene. I stopped throwing parties around the city. Started attending church on a regular basis, and I was showing up and consuming and consuming and consuming, and I felt like God was just calling me to volunteer and to serve in some way. I said, hey, I want you to be a small group leader. I said, I haven't even been a Christian that long. I don't know if I can lead students. He said, yes, you can, because you have a story. You just tell them your story, and I'll give you the words that you need to say along the way. And I said, okay, God, if you want me to do that, I'll do that. So I took a step in that direction. Led a small group for two years. The church that I was at asked me to start hosting, just doing announcements, playing games with students. Started doing that for a little while, and, and after that, they asked me to preach my first sermon. I said, God, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a preacher. I don't know if I can do that. I said, I'll give you the words. I need you to do it. I said, okay, God, if, if that's what you really want me to do, a thousand people for the first time I ever preach, all right, God, I'll do it. So I preached this message to these students, start doing that on a more consistent basis. I eventually get hired at this church as the student pastor. God, I never thought that I'd be in full-time ministry. I want you to go and take that job. Okay, God, I'll do it. Led the student ministry for four years. Led a team of eight people. Loved every second of my job. Met my wife, which was amazing. We got married, moved in together, had this incredible apartment that we absolutely loved. But towards the end of our lease, we felt like God was calling us to be better stewards of our finances. We had some debt that we needed to pay off, and we needed to figure out how we were going to do it. We thought everything was good, that we could just do it over time, but we felt God calling us to do something that was a little bit uncomfortable for us. And so we put on Facebook, hey, does anyone have a basement that we could move into? We move into a basement, and six months later, we've paid off $30,000 worth of debt, and at 30 years old, we're debt-free. I never thought that that was possible for me. No, I didn't have a bank account until my 20s. I never thought that that could happen in my life, but God called me to do it. And I said, okay, God, I'll do whatever you're asking me to do. And he had more in store than what I had in mind. We pay off our debt, and I end up going to a prayer cabin with some friends of mine. And we're praying together in a circle. I go into this room. I sit by myself. I felt like the Lord told me to read the story of Joshua. And so I read through it. And by the end of it, I felt like he was calling me to leave my job, which made no sense to me because I loved my job. I was in ministry. I had a great team. Like, everything was going really well. But I walked back into the room with my friends, and, and another one of my friends said, hey, in my quiet time, Gerald, God told me to tell you to read the story of Joshua. I said, are you kidding me? I just did that. That was Monday. I walked into my boss's office on Thursday and turned in my resignation. I said, okay, God, if that's what you want, I'll do it. I said, what do you want me to do now? He said, you remember well, seven years ago when you went to that conference and you had this idea to start a service-based conference where students could hear worship and teaching, but then they could actually take everything that they learned and go and serve their community? I want you to go to UGA and I want you to do that for college students. I said, God, I'm a gator. <laughs> and I think at that point he laughed and he was like, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. But I want you to go. God, I don't know how to start a nonprofit. It's going to cost $40,000. I don't know how to raise that. But if you want me to do it, I'll do it. So here I am. In October, we'll do our first conference in Athens. Still trying to figure out how we're going to raise the money. I've gotten some incredible people to say yes and to come along in the journey with us. And as we move, God is just continuing to open door after door after door. And so I'm not afraid anymore of how it's going to turn out. I'm not afraid of where the money's going to come from. I know he is going to provide a way because here's what I've realized in my life is that if I say yes to the direction that God is calling me into, it always leads to more. So I've decided that I'm going to be the kind of person who opens my hands, trusts God's with my plans, and I am going to follow Jesus wherever he asks me to go. And I'm just asking you to be that kind of person. 
Because as incredible as it is for you guys to clap for me right now, I appreciate it. I'm grateful for it. But I just want you to know, every day when you decide to wake up and live life like this, there is angels in heaven, and they're looking over at you, and God is looking down at you, and he's going, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. You trust me. You believe in me. You know I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm going to take you to places you never thought you could go if you would just continue to live your life like this and follow me. So what does that look like? Well, it looks like taking steps. Because following always begins with a step. And so maybe for you this morning, your step is that you know God's been calling you to be baptized for a while and you've been fighting it. And maybe this is the day that you say, I'm not fighting it anymore. I'm going to ask someone how to get baptized at this church. Maybe for some of you, you've been coming in, coming in and you've been listening to worship like this and not been really engaged. Maybe for you, the, the decision to make today is I'm going to open my hands and trust God as I worship. And I'm going to engage. Maybe for some of you, the step that you need to take this morning is that you actually need to go home and get in this book for yourself. And not just let people preach to you, but allow God to speak to you through his word. Maybe for some of you, there's a wound that you've been carrying for a really long time. And it's time for you to go to a counselor, a Christian counselor, who can help you process what's been done to you or a decision that you made that's tearing you apart. Maybe for you, the step that you need to take is forgiving someone who's hurt you. I'll tell you one more step that I left out in uh, Israel in April this month. I got a chance to go to Israel. I was sitting and doing communion at the garden tomb, a spot where they think Jesus might have resurrected. I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, call your dad. I said, what? He said, call your dad. I said, why? He said, call your dad. It's ironic, two months before, my half-brother had just followed me on Facebook. I've never met him before. And so I messaged him and said, hey, can I have dad's number? He said, yeah. And so that night in my hotel room, I picked up the phone, I called my dad, and I spoke to him for the first time in 20 years. He said, Gerald, I know there's been distance between us, and I know I've made some mistakes. But I just wanted to let you know that I never stopped loving you. And I said, Dad... I forgive you. Maybe that's the step for you. It's a step of forgiveness. Or maybe the step this morning is is you've been running from Jesus. Maybe you thought you were too broken to be loved by him. But I just want to let you know you're exactly who he loves. And you're exactly who he died for. And so maybe the step this morning is saying yes to following Jesus for the very first time. I don't know what the step is for you, but here's what I know for sure, is that if you will open your hands, trust God with your plans, and take steps in the direction of Jesus, there's always more on the other side. Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for being the God of more. And thank you that more isn't the way that we picture it or want it a lot of the times. Because, God, you love us too much and you know us too well to give us all of the things that we want. But thank you for being the God who gives us everything that we need. And in that, we begin to realize that that is more than what we would have asked for to begin with. So, Father, I just pray for every person in this room that they would have the obedience and the courage today to take a step in your direction, whatever that is, no matter how intimidating it is, no matter how scary it is and how afraid they are, Father, I pray that you would give them the courage to take that step today, to not wait, to not linger, to not sit and pray about it, but to actually just do it right now in this moment. And God, I pray that as they do, it would lead them to the more that you have in store for them. Father, thanks for seeing us. Thanks for being bigger than we ever thought you were. Thanks for having more in store than what we have in mind. We love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said.